Hi, I'm David Bader. I'm a distinguished professor of data science at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, where I direct the Institute for Data Science. And today I want to talk to you about solving global grand challenges with high performance data analytics. I'm an enthusiast for graphs, and I want to take you on a journey to talk with you about graphs and really the resurgence that we see as we're coming out of this pandemic and as we look at new ways to solve the types of problems that really affect populations. Graphs, you've probably heard the word before, and as I talk about them, they're objects that have vertices and there are edges that connect these vertices together. Maybe you've seen a social network where you have people as the vertices, and when you're a friend with someone, you connect them with an edge. Now, this modern view of graphs has been around for quite a number of years. Back in the early 18th century, there was a city of Königsberg in Prussia where there was a challenge given by the king. You see, the city had a number of islands and a number of bridges that connected them together. In fact, there were seven bridges. And the king had this challenge to see if anyone could start on one of the land masses, cross each bridge exactly once, and hopefully come back to their starting point. So the citizens would mill around on the weekends and often on a nice Sunday, they would try to walk around the city and see if they could solve this challenge, but nobody did. It wasn't until 1735 that Leonard Euler came up with a abstraction, a proof using graphs to a more general problem where he proved that you couldn't do this. He turned the city into a graph with four vertices representing the different land masses and edges connecting those vertices, each edge representing a bridge. So there are seven edges, each representing a bridge, and four vertices that connected the um, graph together. And Leonard Euler proved that there was no tour around the city by showing that if the graph is connected and there are any odd degree vertices, it couldn't be done. And when I say odd degree, it means that for a vertex, there's a odd number of bridges connected to it. And so in the town of Königsberg, all four of those land masses had an odd number of bridges connected to them, meaning there is no solution. Now, when I talk about real world graphs and real world problem solving, Often, we're looking at problems where the graphs aren't simple with just simple edges, but often there are weights on those edges, and we're trying to optimize for those weights. So the basis and beginning of what we think of as modern real-world graph problems goes back to almost 100 years ago. In the Czech Republic, there was a mathematician named Adhikar Baruvka. And he had a friend, Jinrik Saxel, who worked at the Zapato Moravska Elektrarni, which was the West Moravian Power Plant Company. And this was the early days of electrical power. And this um, guy, Jinrik Saxel, was trying to connect the South Moravian area with an electric power grid and do it in a cost-effective way. So what he was trying to do was take 40 different points in the region and connect them with transmission lines. And this is a graph problem called the minimum spanning tree. This was the problem that really uh, taxed him. He didn't know how to solve it. So his friend, Adhikar Baruvka, came up with a brute force way to do it. And again, this was 1926. And he published that paper, and it turned out to be the very first real world graph problem that was solved. So this takes us fast forward to what I think of as the modern era of graph theory and applying graphs to real world problems. In fact, I grew up here in the United States and I kind of think that our government tried to sort of covertly have all the kids in this country learn about graphs. I, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite holidays was, was Halloween. It happened in the fall when we had lots of apples around. And here in New Jersey, you, you may know that we have over 30 varieties of apples in New Jersey. So I, I always liked Halloween, and I want to optimize for the two hours that we had to go trick-or-treating 
the amount of goodies that we got. So we would go door to door, knocking on doors, trick or treat, and then hopefully we would get something. Maybe it was a candy bar, a popcorn ball, an apple, and I really liked apples, or maybe it was a trick. You never quite knew. And what we would do is we would create a graph. We would turn each house into a vertex, and we would connect the paths to reach these different houses by edges. And in maybe uh, elementary school, as we were doing this, we would learn graph theory because we would figure out the shortest tour that would take us through the most number of houses. And for me, I, I like to get apples. And so I kind of think our government has been implanting into us the idea of using graphs to solve these real world problems. Now, today, we're faced with big challenges as we get into these massive graph problems. For instance, we may be trying to solve problems on urban sustainability. How do we reduce congestion within cities? How do we improve our transportation networks? What do we do as hurricanes come, for instance, in Louisiana or New Jersey in the Northeast, where we recently had massive flooding and loss of life? How do we evacuate people? How do we tell people what's the best way to get out? And how do we understand what they're going to do in those populations? Or having trustworthy and free and fair elections in this country? or problems such as protecting our infrastructure against cyber attack and giving attribution to those t attacks. These are the types of problems that really are the ones that I'd like to solve. And I know that you would like to have solutions to these because they really make our world a better place and a more enjoyable place to live and also reduce a lot of the problems that we tend to see. So, if we're trying to solve these problems, we now have many different data sources. Those data sources may come from the internet of things and sensors. It may come from system logs. It can, may come from our health informatics records. And we want to take this data and we want to build a graph out of it and use these graphs in order to improve the human condition. Now, previously, these data sets would fit on our laptops. We could go and we could download some software, run it on our laptop, and get a solution pretty fast. But now these data sets are growing in size. They have maybe millions, billions, trillions, even more of records of information. And those data sets may be on the order of petabytes in size. And so we're working on tools that will be able to take these massive data sets, say, for instance, tens of terabytes, and be able to democratize data science on them by allowing everybody to use a common interface to ask their queries of these data sets. Today, the language of data science is called Python. This is a very productive, easy to use framework where people use different toolkits like NumPy and PD arrays to operate on their data sets. And when their data is held locally, it is interactive. It works really, really well. But when those data sets occur and are held in different data warehouses or large scale storage, it becomes very difficult to interact with them. So we're working on a framework called Arcuda. And Arcuda is initially developed by the Department of Defense and we're building out the graph analytic capabilities within this framework. The front end to our CUDA looks very familiar. It looks like Python with a very easy to use front end. So any data scientist can pick it up and interact with it. But their data may be sitting on the back end in a supercomputer using a novel programming language called Chapel from HPE Cray. And so when you issue your commands, it may return in near real time. You may get your answers instantaneously. But we're working on the algorithms and the heavy lifting in order to have the data on the back end be running those calculations that are needed to solve the problems that I, I just discussed. So here at NGIT, we're really excited by doing this work on making graph analytics at scale interactive 
and really available to everyone. And that includes citizen scientists who are really trying to learn about data science. Now, we're also in a very interesting era of being on the cusp of something called exascale supercomputing. We're about to see in this world the first machine that can run 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. That's a lot of computing. And these highly capable machines are going to be fantastic for doing these types of graph analytic problems. But only when those data sets are static, meaning I can pick up that data set and load it into that computer. Where we're headed to in the future is more streaming applications, streaming data, and streaming graphs. And where we're really focused and where I think the future is, is being able to do predictive analytics, taking in data streams and building new computer systems that are able to reason about that data and make decisions in near real time rather than collecting data after something has happened and analyzing the data forensically in a big supercomputer. So I'm excited by having graphs all around us. Every problem I see, I look at, I see graphs. And I hope that you will too, and that we're really at this age of this resurgence of looking at how to solve problems better in the new world going forward and how to really make the world a better place. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to you using graphs and liking graphs as much as I do here. Thank you.